reading from both our epistle and gospel text. Do not cease to give thanks for you. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God, the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom, revelation, the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you, what riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and to what immeasurable greatness of His power towards us who believe, according to the working of His great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the, at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. For a gospel reading, Then he led them out as far as Bethany, lifted up his hands, he blessed them, and while, blessed, and while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, blessing God. In our first reading, from Acts, we have Luke, who is recording to Theophilus, and he says something regarding what the apostles saw. And what the apostles saw was something that should not have been possible at all. And we keep seeing this with Jesus as they go through the liturgical church here. By the way, I highly recommend that on your kitchen you have a calendar for day-to-day -day and a church calendar for day-to-day -day so that you know what day we're going through and what day is celebrated. Because today we are celebrating Ascension Day, the day when Christ ascended into heaven. We remember it, but we do more than just remember it. We do much more than just remember things about Jesus. The Christian faith is so much more than just remembering things about Jesus, things that happened once upon a time. Rather, it's much, much more than that. And I'm going to show you that in these texts, that it is much more than that. Just remembering. So these apostles were all gathered around right there with Christ. Now remember, these are the same disciples who three years ago were called away from their jobs, were even called away from their parents, were even called away from their riches. One which turned away because he had great riches, but later would sell to the poor and would come after Christ and follow Him. These disciples who would follow Christ anywhere that they would go. And then of course, there's Peter who would say he wouldn't even let Christ die. He would not even let Christ die. Same, the same Peter who we will learn in our vacation Bible school this year, as Christ approached to wash his feet, he said, No, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Christ says, If you, if I do not wash you, you have no part in me. And so Peter says, Well, don't only wash my feet, wash my head as well. And Christ says, Those who have washed are clean, but not all. Now, the reason that I bring this up is because you see the disciples going with Christ step by step by step by step. All the way to the Garden of Gethsemane, 
where they couldn't even stay awake. Or before that, to the Last Supper. And then, to Christ's own arrest, where Peter, of course, again, would cut off a guy's ear so that Christ would not be taken and crucified. Now, I don't know what his full plan was there, but there you have it in Scripture. He cut off a guy's ear. To which Christ picked up and put back on his head. Now, the apostles have been seeing all of these things happening. All the miracles. And remember, remember, miracles are not just things that happen so that we can say, wow, Jesus was really good at stuff. All miracles point, or all miracles are epiphanies. All miracles point that Christ is the Messiah, even the picking up of a severed ear and putting it back onto the head of a soldier. These same disciples, once again, would watch Christ be crucified, or watch Him be uh, uh, arraigned, and then watch Him be um, uh, uh, judged, and then as they, was, as they were, He was being beaten, they would all run, and Peter again would deny. Then they would crucify Him, and again, the disciples who had followed them, given up everything, would take off leaving him to die. And so he did. The thing about it is that they could, they could not outrun the grace of God. They may have ran from the cross, but they didn't get very far. The forgiveness of Christ is always following you. And so, they all run and they hide, and then Christ raises from the dead and He comes to them in a room that was locked and He says, Peace be with you. And, and they assume that He's a ghost. They feed Him. And again, what I'm doing is I'm showing you all of the things the disciples have seen and done and yet they still seem to be amazed at the things that Christ can do. And here, we have this, our first reading. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? That is, after his resurrection. Now that you have done this death and resurrection thing, now will you do for us Jews what we would like for you to do? Restore the house of Israel. And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the season that the Father has fixed by His own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. And when He had said these things, as they were looking on, He was lifted up, and, lifted up, and a cloud took Him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, He went. And behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, and this is here I want you to listen to, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, the same Jesus that you have been following, that same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. In other words, what are you looking at? What are you expecting? They saw Christ ascend into heaven, and I'm sure that they were amazed by that. But then there were these two guys saying, what, what are you waiting on? What, what, what are you doing? Why are you gazing up into heaven? Because don't you know that, that the Lord will come in the same way that He ascended? So shall He descend to, be, uh, to judge both the living and the dead. So why are you wasting your time looking up into heaven? Looking up there. Because Christ will come when Christ will come. And it's not, and it's none of your business when the Father chooses hit the time from his own authority. It's none of our business. 
So then I ask us, are we navel gazing or the heavenly equivalent of navel gazing? Are we watching up, waiting for Christ to come idly by looking up and ignoring our neighbors? Looking up and ignoring the institutions that Christ has given unto us. Looking up and not caring for one another. Looking up and taking for granted all that has been given unto you. Before I became a pastor, I never understood how th thankful I should have been to have a pastor. Are, we, are you too busy looking into the clouds to give thanks that God has given you an under-shepherd? Am I too busy looking into the clouds to, to see how wonderful you are and how much you support me and love me and my wife and my child, the children here, and each and every one of you. Now, I'm not saying you're perfect. You're not. But, are, am I too busy looking into the clouds to see you? And are you too busy looking into the clouds waiting for Jesus to see me. But then we get to our gospel text. And this is where it all becomes clear. Because the answer is this. Because obviously the angels, the two men said, stop it. Why are you wasting your time looking into the air? When there are brothers and sisters around you, in fact, you should not be looking into the air at all. But I'll tell you what you should be doing, apostles, disciples, lovers of Christ. And we read here in our gospel text, as, the, as Christ was risen from the dead, or as Christ was ascended into heaven, we then see this, you are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of the Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power on high. Then he, being Christ, led them out as far as Bethany. And he parted from them. He, that is, he was carried into heaven. Now look at this part. They worshipped him and they returned to the temple continually blessing God. So if the question is, okay, pastor, we're not supposed to be gazing into heaven, waiting on Christ to come down, then how do we wait? How should we wait? And right there's the answer. Christ has ascended, and we are no different than the disciples. You are to wait in the temple, continually blessing Him. In other words, long story short, if I haven't overstepped those bounds, go to church. Go to the temple. Hear His Word. Receive His sacrament. Because when you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, you do so, but if, when you do so, you proclaim the death of our Lord until He returns again. Go to the temple. Go to church. Let this church grow. Not, not in terms of mission or in terms of uh, gimmick or in terms of any other thing than this. Jesus told you to. Jesus said, as he, was, as he ascended into heaven, you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I am sending the promise of the Father. Baptism, the Lord's Supper, means of grace, the preached word. Even Wednesday's teachings, both on the divine service and the adults. All of these teachings 
They are being taught to you as the promise. And then he says to stay in the city until you are clothed from power on high. And then when you are clothed with power on high, Christ was, uh, when they were clothed with, with uh, power from on high, what did they do with that? They went to church. They went to the temple to wait for Christ to return. And you know what? They died waiting. All the people in our cemetery have died waiting. I can't say that you will die waiting. Hopefully the Lord will return. But we don't watch for Him here. We watch for Him here. Waiting for Christ to return. To judge the living and the dead. And to forgive you of your sins where you have done wrong. To one another. To mother against daughter. Father against son. Neighbor against neighbor. Club organization against club organization. Whatever the case may be. Be it temperature in the sanctuary or whatever. Let it be argued, discussed, and then brought here to hear the Word of God in His temple. If, we're, if we as sinners are going to fight amongst one another, let us do so, but repent, repair, and wait in the temple of God. That's why Christ says to you that if you have not forgiven your brother or sister, do not receive the Lord's Supper, but leave your gift at the altar, go and forgive your brother, and then return. So I warn you, if there is someone you have not forgiven, do not partake of communion today. Go and forgive them. And if they're on the other side of the aisle, you can wait and go around and forgive them. But let us forgive one another as Christ has forgiven us. And then as we enter into this temple waiting and we commune, as I said, we commune as a proclamation of the Lord's crucifixion until He returns. So the celebration of ascension is simply this, not that Jesus could do it, but that we are honored to gather together to await His return not by doing nothing, but by receiving everything. And that's the glory. Easter never really ends. It never ends. Thanks be to God. Amen.